Um, Dr. Oh, okay. Dr. Oliver Mwemba is a lecturer and the head of Department of Health Promotion and Education at the School of Public Health, University of Zambia. He has a social science background with a Master of Philosophy in Health Promotion and International Health from University of Bergen, Norway, and he has a PhD in Social Science and Health from Leeds Beckett University, United Kingdom. Dr. Mwemba has over 10 years research experience in applying social, social behavioral sciences and methods to complex public health, health promotion and medical interventions in Africa. He is currently involved in um, some US NIH funded projects such as the application of uh, implementation science approaches to assess the effectiveness of task shifted WHO pen to address cardiometabolic complications in people living uh, with HIV AIDS in Zambia. He is also a co-investigator in a United States uh, NIH funded study aimed at increasing the availability and acceptability of voluntary medical male circumcision and early infant male circumcision in Zambia. In 2020, he was a Commonwealth Professional Fellow at Cardiff Metropolitan University in the United Kingdom on health communication and academic leadership. And he is currently serving on the editorial board on health promotion, international journal and critical public health journal. I hope uh, we are all going to learn something from this presentation. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We'll read them out at the end of the presentation and Dr. Mwemba will be able to address them. Over to you, Dr. Mwemba. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to share my, my, my screen. Um, yeah. Okay, and maybe also before I share, let me just stop one second. Yeah, because when I showed my video, some people were not in. So that's how Dr. Mwemba looks. So, so basically, uh, as Mwenda said, I, I, I'm in the School of Public Health at Munza. Uh, basically, School of Public Health is a new school. Uh, before then, it used to be called Department of Community Medicine and School of Medicine. Yeah, so, so basically in that particular school, we have a lot of uh, people with different backgrounds and because of the nature of public health. Yeah. All right, so let me just then, I think I'll switch off the video for purposes of connectivity uh, and then uh, I'll switch it on later on, yeah. Okay, so are you able to see? Yep. Okay, yeah, so so, so I pitched my talk to uh, basically with, with this title, Critical Perspectives in, in Medicine and Healthcare, and particularly focusing more on the social determinants of health. Uh, because basically within the, the critical perspectives in medicine, there's quite a whole range of many other things. But of course, uh, there's the determinants of health, a uh, uh, basically perspective is one of the dominating, but there are many other aspects within that, which includes some ethical uh, perspectives as well. And they, so sometimes we broadly call them ethical, legal, and social implications of advances in medicine or healthcare. Sometimes the focus can be on technology, it can be on, uh, on uh, particular interventions that may not necessarily involve technology. It may be uh, looking at the social legal implications or uh, ethical implications of maybe advances in uh, things like genomics research uh, and other things. Yeah. So basically, a so to mention the way the way I put the titles to try to uh, to put something that is eye catching. So hopefully that it will attract people to, to actually really uh, look forward to, to hear what will be said. 
but as you'll see later, what we'll be talking about are, are things we, we are aware. Of. And I think it's just a matter of bringing them on the table to discuss them further. Because I think even if you are aware about them, they, I think there's still quite a lot we have not done. And uh, so we need to think how we can work around. And my, 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 I've been library involved. This talk is to go for about 30 minutes and we'll have 10 minutes uh, uh, discussion. Uh, so, so let me then maybe just start with some few things and then we will keep the, the, the momentum will be getting strong as we go. Okay. So, so, so in terms of the outline, so uh, I'll, I'll just actually read, basically talk about two models. So I'll talk about the traditional model, which we sometimes call biomedicine, uh, which we call also pathogenesis uh, approach. So it has many other names, uh, of course. So uh, basically the talk or uh, the tone on, on that is, is more of trying to actually talk about how basically uh, it evolved and uh, particularly with the understanding of biological sciences and how it contributed to understanding of medicine, how to a large extent, uh, basically up to today, traditional medicine perspectives are still largely uh, influenced by uh, biological determinants of health. So I'll say something like that, but I know that uh, even as I put that, what I call traditional view, this actual view has shifted even within medical training and medical practice uh, uh, across the globe and in some countries. So, so I'm, I'm actually, to a, for the purpose of this discussion, discussing probably what I can, can call an ashed position, because yeah, it has actually evolved and try to actually bring out to a large extent, some of the criticisms that have been raised again as such. And why, even if I call it ancient, why we keep on getting more saying it's close to a large extent, we still more or less like fall back to, to read largely more than actually other models. So then I'll talk about the sultrogenesis model, which sometimes we call a social model of wealth. And then uh, out of it will come some ideas around social determinants of health and just maybe uh, make suggestions on how we can incorporate a, a sarcogenic model in healthcare practice. So I think the, the position, uh, the overall position is not to actually really argue that the sarcogenic model should replace the pathogenesis, but actually it should supplement. So, because we, we actually need both perspectives, particularly for, for medical doctors, for people who are in healthcare nurses and all that, they still need to understand a bigger, a deeper issues in biology. But basically, I think the argument with the cellulogenic model is that uh, it's not enough. We need to go beyond and actually consider context in which actually patients come from and in which we actually do all these medical encounters. So, pathogenesis or biomedicine, which we call the traditional view of the world. So, it's also known as a lot of medicine. So, of course, over the years, it has become dominant. Often, it's considered. Uh, the relevant aspect of medical systems and the healthcare problem. So it's dominating uh, in terms of uh, basically reach and also in terms of uh, power and, and basically even in terms of uh, the number of people like employed in, in, the, in that form of sector. So, but of course, I think you would like to know that in our context, for example, the biggest, even if biomedicine is, the, is still dominating, the biggest sector still remains what we call self-medication, the popular sector. And actually even, we still have 70% of people in Zambia, for example, still actually a, a more or less like juggling between the hospital biomedicine and also traditional medicine. So, so there's quite a, a, some kind of a, a, a mixed breed in, in our context, particularly. So, but of course we know uh, because of the, the nature of how it came based on Western philosophy uh, and Western culture and its reach through, of course, the colonialism project, it has actually really become so dominant such that it has become almost indigenous to our communities. Uh, but of course, to a large extent, it also found other medical systems, which to a large extent, mostly people have to uh, navigate uh, in between. To before they, as I, as they actually try to 
to see what kind of uh, health issues they have and how they interpret it. They navigate between either self-medication or traditional medicine or, or going to the hospital and all that. And in most cases, sometimes they tend to mix even the care. So uh, of course, one aspect is biomedical insiders often take their own view as object. and reject mostly low effects. So as you know, this actually is a movement which actually has certain assumptions that are very much influenced by what we call post positivistic philosophy, which actually really, um, yeah, so it was telling me my, my internet was unstable, but I hope you're still able to hear me. Yeah, so which actually really uh, argues uh, that basically reality is actually there's an objective reality out there. And so that's why at the end of the day, because of its ability to have been able to show and demonstrate efficacy on a number of things, it has is considered as, uh, as objective and to a large extent, lay or uh, local interpretations are actually considered scientific and to some extent dangerous. So as I said, it's rooted in Western science conception of reality. So, which basically is linked to what we call post-positivism. And they, of course, uh, the criticisms that have been leveled on science itself as it has been evolved over the years are some of the criticisms that have been leveled uh, with biomedicine, which actually still more leans towards the practice that actually really is traditional. So, of course, it assumes that reality is basically material, nature is physical, and objective knowledge can be attained, okay? And they, it's influenced by what we call monotheism, which actually determines the idea of a single truth and the model of practice. So to a large extent, and basically by virtue of its dominance, uh, to a large extent, it is sort of like foreshadows other, other ways. Particularly uh, in our countries, uh, people, because of many other reasons, they have to, they, are, they cannot proudly say, I went to a traditional doctor for this and all that. They have to always, go in the undercover of darkness for fear of excommunication from a cousin of medicine called religious movements, okay? So there's a connection in all this because they are part of the broader colonial project. Actually, they say religion, medicine, and colonialism are from the same piece of cloth. Yeah. So, I don't know why I can't move my slide this time around. Okay. All right. So, so because of that position, it tends to have what we call a reduction view of a sickness, basically based on a, the physical bodies than phenomena. Of course, to some extent, it still includes some psychological aspects as well, but mostly just supplemental. It's still based on more understanding of biology or body chemistry and all that kind of stuff. Of course, sickness in that traditional view is seen to be a malfunction of cells, molecules, or body anatomies and all that, rather than actually social relations. So in this context, then microscopes, test tubes are more important than actually stories of sufferers with cure, uh, more important than actually health. So in this particular, the focus is actually towards cure and they, it focuses more on seeing a problem, diagnosing and actually really eliminating that abnormality in the body, okay? Don't know why. Let me just stop sharing and reshare again. I sticking. Okay, somehow it has, okay, so. As you guess, uh, the critique of this pathogenesis, as you know, genesis is beginning. So uh, why we call it pathogenesis, but basically it's really more about touching with a pathogen. So the explanation of disease begins with a pathogen. So that's why you say pathogenesis. And as you see, on the contrary, saltogenesis actually really uh, argues the other way around to say, pathogens only thrives where social conditions allow. So we need to actually really look at uh, 
social conditions. And actually, if you deal with those, even pathogens to some extent become limited in terms of how they can navigate and who they infect. Yeah, so one of the criticism actually uh, is, it has been criticized and this, uh, this criticism, uh, which we call dogmatism, uh, is actually one which has also been leveled on science in general. Uh, say, why are science actually, when it arose, uh, we, in this particular case, I'm talking about the science of Francis Bacon, uh, it, in, in, during the time of enlightenment, why are they No idea was to liberate itself from domestic authority, religious movement, which actually modestly be able to deal with some of their problems. So solidify the position to actually, so there's that criticism. So being dogmatic is the strong expression of opinion as if they were facts. So an example of dogmatic is insisting that a particular view is the one and only way to look at things. So why it has been a, a, a sense and of course a biomedical view has been accused like that is because it tends to actually really, uh, it doesn't actually really uh, more or less like incorporate other ways of, of seeing or knowing or actually really of defining and experiencing illness. So this particular one has been actually was leveled uh, uh, and uh, by a, uh, uh, actually is a, is a psychiatrist, is uh, is a, a doctor, but he's also a medical anthropologist as a claimant. That covered. So he actually identified a list of dogmas related to this view. And as you see, I, I rely quite a lot on, on Arthur Clement's writing because he has done quite a lot of intensive research on alternative medicine and alternative uh, philosophies on issues of medicine and all that. So yeah. Dr. Mwemba, you've cut out. Sorry. Can you hear us, Dr. Mwamba? Actually, I define this up. Apologies, we're just having some connection challenges. We'll try and get Dr. Mwemba back online as soon as possible. Apologies for the delay. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can you hear you now. Oh, sorry. I don't even know at what point I, I lost you. Was I already on the, uh, the dogmatism? Yes, that was it. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, I think I was talking about the last point, so, but I can just run through. So one is uh, the, the aspect that actually patients, when they do things themselves to try to deal with ailments, uh, it's considered dangerous. And then, of course, biological aspects are given prominence over other aspects like social, psycho, social, cultural. And then the relationship between a doctor and patient is one between an expert and one who is actually ignorant. So the doctor's role in most cases, in this particular case is to give instructions and the patient is expected to comply. And we use terms like adherence and all that. And they, of course, so they, sometimes they, they, the question I always ask sometimes when I'm talking to students is like they say if a woman is living with cancer cervical cancer for seven years and they, we have also a, a doctor who has specialized in oncology for seven years who knows better about cervical cancer so of course uh, there is some form of knowledge in both sides so one is more theoretical conceptual the other one is more experiential so it's not true that uh, patients are actually ignorant they may not have the language 
to say, or I can't really talk about, but this is the way they experience that. So of course, that's why because of that, uh, that aspect within the discussion of parallel relations between health workers and, and patients actually is, is something that people are looking back say, there is something that the doctor can also learn from the patients or relatives. Okay, so. Okay, so it's trying to. Okay, so the other criticism is basically what we call mystification. So mystification actually is a concept that comes uh, from more uh, uh, neo Marxists, or actually it comes from uh, or, uh, originally from Karl Marx. So Karl Marx was a philosopher who lived uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, around it should be 18th or 17th, 18th or 19th century. So he's a well-known person and he was actually quite critical of the capitalistic society. And uh, based on his arguments, actually uh, on how, for example, religion played a role, a role in, 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 terms of, in terms of trying to actually really make uh, what they call the proletariats at that particular time, the workers to actually really be obedient and work within the capitalistic system without revolution, he was able to actually really say religion acted as an opium of the poor and they, of the people. And you are, you are a doctor, so you use opium sometimes to actually really uh, uh, more or less like uh, treat somebody with intensive pain. Okay, so he also says in a similar way, religion actually had a way of suppressing intensive pain. And in the process, it actually really distorts the reality we really have. So we, when, when pain is, just, is actually pressed down or it's not actually there, we tend to think things are okay. And in the process, we have a distorted view of reality. So this is what they call mystification. So that concept comes from there and it has been applied to the criticism of medicine as well. So mystification hides the, the nature of reality and serves to maintain the status quo and protect those in power. That's actually the argument in that. So basically this argument, as I say, is that medicine doesn't do enough to try to change society. Rather, it's more of a conformist discipline, it's particularly the, the traditional view. And at the end of the day, it does very true to actually really look at the context that actually makes people sick in the first place. So that's a concept of mystification. So when it's applied to biomedicine, biomedicine is seen as mystifying, okay, social, economic, political problems by making them appear individual, biological, and natural. So it hides or ignores the social issues of sickness, hence conceals the sources of injustice and suffering. So, so uh, by actually really, uh, of course, we're focusing on the individual and more of biological demands. So it has been uh, uh, accused that it, it doesn't do much and it, it actually really mystify the social, all those, the, self, the context, which actually really creates that sickness. And in the process, it comes, uh, remember this in a neo Marxist view. So it becomes an accomplice with the power of people in society, in the capitalist society, pharmaceutical companies, and many other people who actually, at the end of the day, benefit from getting people. And actually, there is usually an argument to say capitalism makes us work hard and in the process we get sick and then we actually in, when we get sick we it creates a market for us to get medicine and then that kind of a thing so it's quite a whole complex discussion there so because of that i think it argues that uh, issues of social justice and people who actually really get exposed to diseases just because of the structure of society are actually not uh, looked at in, in detail there's also another criticism which sometimes it's called medicalization. So it's related to, to mystification to some extent, but basically it describes the reach that actually medicine has really gone beyond its original uh, original jurisdiction, where sometimes now uh, problems that were non-medical have been defined and treated as medical problem. So I think we have situations like childbirth at some point was not a a medical issue. And I think we still have countries like Poland that largely still encourage uh, home deliveries and only deal with emergencies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in, even like, And basically, if you look at the site where we are, it was something that was done by uh, elders in the community and all that. So when 
it became a hospital issue, you find there's been all this back and forth uh, uh, between a woman has to actually really try to navigate between what the culture says. And because in that context, pregnancy was uh, signified something culturally. So you find at the end of the day, there's a pool. You'll find some women sometimes will come, you give them folic acid or uh, those anemic tablets, they don't take them because they are suspicious with the healthcare system. So it's because to a large extent, some of these things have never been. And they, so this has been one of the, uh, the criticism that has been leveled. So as you see, the problem is defined in medical terms, describing using medical language understood through the adoption of medical frameworks or treated with medical interventions. But basically, there are much more interventions that can be done at more political level that can still actually really reduce disease at more social level that can actually reduce it is just by actually reorganizing our society. Okay, so like, for example, if you look for those of you who are not staying in Osaka, so in Osaka, we have, we always have hotspots for, for waterborne diseases like cholera. They always happen in one of the places called Kanyama and all that. So, so basically, the argument there is that there's actually more to disease because it has to do with the context in which actually people live, issues of housing and all that, which we will talk later about and social determinants of health. So medicalization transforms aspects of everyday life into pathologies. And they, so the focus uh, as a result in, 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 the med, in this medicalization uh, critique is that the problem is individual rather than social environment and it calls for individual intervention rather than collective social solutions. And also by expanding the medical distribution, medication increases the amount of medical social control over human behavior and possibly replacing them with other forms of social control. And to a large extent, human beings, of course, they are not passive followers. Sometimes they engage in resistance. I think right now we are all battling with the issue of uh, vaccine hesitance. And the, it's all connected to a large extent with people trying to resist what sometimes they, 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 they can call suspicious Western medical project and that you have to actually understand the history in, in context of the colonial projects and how medicine was part of it and how that still lingers uh, to actually really uh, haunt us up to today so so basically they, those uh, and to a large extent now i think we are living in an age where uh, people have really lost faith uh, on science and actually some of the medical interventions so it looks like we have a debt we have to do with the communities and that should really work. And that's why to a large extent, considering the, these social determinants of health becomes important. Okay, and also medicalization increases the profitability and markets of pharmaceutical companies and technology. And some of the pushback we see actually come uh, from, from such kind of thinking, say actually a medicine is an agent of a capitalistic society. There's also a, like one of the main criticisms, but one, one more I can actually talk about post-colonial criticism, uh, particularly maybe important for those working in the context of Africa, Zambia and Namibia. I know there are people here, but of course, even people in the UK, uh, at the end of the day, we're global citizens. You may want to come and work here, or you may actually be working in international development program. So, so basically, I'm leaning more on one of the prominent uh, post-colonial theorists, uh, who actually has been writing on indigenous knowledge from Botswana, uh, Chelisa Bagere. So she's actually a professor at University of Botswana. So for example, she actually analyzed how colonial discourse has actually entrenched itself in health programs in a post-colonial society and actually systematically excludes local ways of knowing. So the term we use mostly in post-colonial theory is it others or othering of other forms of knowledge. And it's, it's related to the concept of like monotheism, thinking that the only way of actually really understanding illness is this way. Local ways, traditionalism is not, it's, yeah, so there's that kind of like hierarchy or sometimes altogether dismissing uh, that. So indigenous methods are not rewarded by current business economic model, particularly in the capitalistic society. They, don't, they are not seen to have capital value. Yet actually, even if some of that knowledge, like even which pharmaceutical companies are actually able to so it came from a uh, local knowledge so and the indigenous knowledge is generally stigmatized marginalized by western hegemonic western based approaches in health program so people usually are ashamed to actually really uh, uh, 
if they sought services from a Georgina, they will not even say it remains a secret. And they even when you actually talk about uh, students trying to get a sense of like other forms of uh, healing and all that, particularly traditional medicine, sometimes they may be a bit of resistance until, of course, in later years, as uh, people come student the doctor, they begin to realize there's quite a lot that actually can be learned from there as well. So then, so because of that, so actually Bagele argues that health programs privilege Western ways of knowing about disease and delegated to the periphery, local understanding of disease. And we tend to actually call what people will actually say or interpret about uh, diseases as myths and misconceptions. So those are the terms we actually really use. Yeah, so like for example, one example I usually give is uh, basically when we, when we grew up in the village, so would eat sometimes uh, some stunted stalks of maize. They, they, they are very sweet like sugar cane. I don't know if you know sugar cane, my colleagues from, from Europe. So they eat sugar, will eat sugar cane. And in most cases, people say, no, no, it will give you malaria. But basically, when you actually really say that, it will be called myths and misconceptions. Uh, but basically, if you actually really zoom a bit more closely, why people have associated eating of those stalks of maize with malaria is because each time uh, the stalks of maize come as a result of floods. In most cases, it's in those years when there are floods and uh, the maize will not grow and fertilizer will be washed away and then they'll become yellow and you eat those. And what happens when there's water, uh, uh, that actually really, uh, uh, more like in, in shallow wells and all that mosquitoes breed. And they have seen here in and out, which what, for what we call lay knowledge, or lay association that each time, each year, these this, this, uh, children are eating this. We also have, we tend to have actually these symptoms of temperature and all that. So they're able to associate it basically from what I can call environmental determinant of health, which actually means if you look at the concept of malaria from its original Latin, Latin Greek meaning, it actually really has to do with more environment. So there's quite a whole range of things. And they, at the end of the day, lay knowledge is not actually completely useless. So when people actually think in a particular way, if you just zoom and look through, you'll be able to actually see that there is something that they have experienced, uh, which actually makes them think that way. So, the, so basically, because that information is relegated, it alienates them and to a large extent, sometimes they actually really engage in passive resistance. And sometimes that's where we actually see they are suspicious of other forms, yeah. so. And in this particular case, we find local people are considered subjects that need to adhere to medical regimen and expected to change their behavior. So we use the term like behavior change, okay? Like particularly in health promotion, public health, traditional public, we use those terms. And it's not any different from concepts, colonial concepts like civilizing the savages, okay? So like because we have always considered like they don't know, so we need to actually tell them about that. So, so because of that, uh, and because of the powerfulness of, of medical regimes, they engage in passive resistance. Sometimes they even tell, you know, I drank the medicine, but if you actually, if you do blood tests, you'll find they never even took. And uh, I think in early years of ART, uh, when people are studying issues of adherence, they actually saw that a self-report and actually actual a blood, uh, when you do blood specimen, uh, testing, it was actually totally different. And it's because of all these dynamics. Yeah, so what are we saying? At the end of the day, you actually see that uh, cytogenesis and pathogenesis actually complement each other. And we are not dismissing the importance of biology, biochemistry, and all basic science, anatomy, physiology, very, very important. So what we, we are actually asking is an expansion to the understanding of disease, because the body exists in context, in space. And so, like, for example, in anthropology, there's what we call, we distinguish between a biological body and a social body. And that's when we actually really look at how uh, we actually really uh, work with our bodies in context of fitting in a particular social context. So if, for example, we put tattoos or we actually, uh, for example, bleach our skins, uh, put some pieces of hair, we are actually trying to fit a particular social context. But some of those body alterations have health consequences or sometimes we may take certain drugs to look in a particular way. And that way, actually, you begin to see that medicine cannot be actually decontextualized from the things that actually really uh, create them in context of health. 
So if you look, pathogenesis it has been a basically narrow, simplistic understanding of health, expansion of disease and illness was rooted in biological science. And basically its definitions were more uh, focusing on absence of disease, disability, focus on pathology, versus individual factors. Why the influences were actually not taken consideration or were secondary and the health associated uh, with individual bodies that's supposed to be and the physically separated from the social context. But the subtrogenesis actually is an extension which actually argues for a broader understanding of health. Explanation is rooted in a range of social factors. So if health is caused by structural factors such as poverty, inequalities, and more holistic definition of health, take into consideration a psychological social dimension. And part of the reason why, to a large extent, there has been reluctance to bring in this, because you can't measure them with traditional methods, like the way we have been doing quantitative methods and all that. This actually requires bringing in other ways of, of doing research as well, which also includes a participation of communities, like community-based participatory, to actually really wake and co be co-creators of knowledge with, with, a, a, with a basically doctors, health workers. Yeah, as you see, I'm struggling to say with X, Experts, because I think at the end of the day, uh, expertism is 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 dependent. So if somebody has is living with cancer and they are uh, they are actually living in it for seven years and somebody has started it, who is the real expert? It's tough. It's debatable. So and then we need to take into consideration this self-genesis uh, takes into consideration wider influences such as the impact on environment and also inequalities. And therefore, health is seen as a social construct and subjective experience, including lay. Uh, knowledge is actually taken into consideration. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, subtrogenesis focuses more on upstream thinking. I shall try to actually look at the context and social determinants of health and the health inequalities become very, very prominent. So I think basically, as you see here, it focuses more on closing the tap rather than actually continuing mopping. Of course, uh, in 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 a in a rural society, there will still continue leakage of stuff because people may be washing their hands. That you, you still have, we still need more parts. But basically, it raises ethical and the, uh, economic questions as well. If we we leave that tap running there, so we are, well, that's basically the the whole focus. And they basically, Michael Moment. Some of you may know him. Michael Moment uh, is a. Uh, I think he should be the president of Zam a World Medical Association right now. So actually in his book, World, uh, The Health Gap, he actually starts a, his first sentence is why treat people and send them back to the same conditions that made them sick in the first place. So basically, if you look, this is a picture, I don't know if it's visible. Look at the, the environments, the communities. This is where disease gets, it's actually dealt with. So at the end of the day, we can't just be receiving cases without doing much in the context. Of course, at the end of the day, doctors cannot go and try to actually build out and all that. But I think it's just as you see later on that I'm talking about uh, some kind of multidisciplinary approach, okay? So, yeah. So as I think these, these things have been known for a long time, so they are not new. So if you look, the, uh, this is a microbiologist in, 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 in a book, Man Adapting 1965. He actually said the prevalence and severity of microbial diseases are conditioned more by the way of life of person afflicted than the virulence and the properties of an etiological agent. Hence, they need to learn more of man and his society in order to make sense of the patterns of disease. And this is, is particularly important in public health, but I think in medicine as well. Okay, have to go back. Yeah, so this is another argument. Uh, diseases, disease epidemic is a social process. Spread of infectious agents is, is shaped by political economy, social relations, and culture. AIDS has struck, for example, a particular severity in communities struggling under the burdens of poverty and fight economic crisis. And, and I think we even know what is happening with COVID-19, particularly in the US, in, in Brazil, uh, France, all these multicultural communities, I'm sure even in the UK, where actually people of color are actually uh, are being affected more. And it, there's quite a bit more of a, a understanding now on why that is. And it, it all goes back to understanding complex issues on how the society is organized and where and how it actually found itself and where we are coming from. Yeah, so and it, that's actually is one of the things that we actually try to do. And it, if you look, for example, all these numbers. So this is 
uh, if you look at the trends in life expectancy. So look at sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So uh, a person like me who is 45, literally, uh, I'm expected to die. Uh, and it, basically, these are not excellent. It's because of the context. It is uh, the life expectancy is linked to many other things in society. Yeah. And they basically, it's the same thing. If you look at under five mortality, that's the 100 life births by Earth gap. You can actually see the poor, the poorer somebody's, the, 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 the higher the mortality. And you can actually see it's the same, even within country and across country. So it tells us that there is something that we need to actually do and we can't continue ignoring. And so the Brecho actually is working with this model uh, where we actually need to contextualize. There are, of course, immediate issues we can contextualize what we may call material circumstances, issues of cultural, social capital, and then social economic positions, social structures, and all that, and the broader macroeconomic context. So we need to actually really uh, see how that can actually work. So I think at the end of the day, the Commission on Solid and actually say the circumstances which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and the systems in place to do with it, this is very, very important. So improving daily living conditions makes a difference. These circumstances are shaped by a wider set of forces, of course, the economy, social policies, politics, and all that, and largely responsible for health inequalities, which we actually just saw there. So now, having said this, all these are complex, deep topics, and they actually raise uh, debates. Uh, but basically, I think the best is health in, in society to actually really uh, think of the best way. Because I think at the end of the day, people are competing to try to find the best way to actually really organize ourselves that we can all beat without people dying prematurely. So suggestions on how we can incorporate a serotogenic perspective in healthcare. So remember, this is a supplemental a, a approach. So we are not discarding the pathogenesis. We need both. So I've made four suggestions, and I'm sure there can be more. So multiple epistemologies. So I will talk about newness narratives and explanatory models, which actually Arthur Clayman has written quite a lot. And they, I'll talk about improving health, worker, patient interaction and communication, and also issues of multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and intersectoral approach, as well as indigenous knowledge and decolonization of healthcare practice. And they, in trying to do this, I'm trying to actually uh, respond or react to some of the criticism that has been uh, revealed against the traditional uh, view of, of health. So illness, narratives, and experimental models. So I think every clinician is familiar with a patient, and I'm sure some of you are already seeing patients, who, uh, with a patient who, with whose disease has been treated successfully, and who actually obtained uh, persisting complaining of uh, symptoms, as well as patients who drop out of treatment despite active. So there are all these issues. So basically, uh, why this happens, and social scientists have been able actually to distinguish between disease and illness. So actually, when you talk about illness, we are talking about a subjective experience of physical and mental states, which uh, can be based on underlying disease pathology or not, and can also be a, a out of social reactions from the social environment. So usually when you talk about patienthood or broadly illness, we are actually really talking about the patient's subjective feeling. And that subjective feeling is influenced by their culture and their communities and all that. Things like stigma, for example, a, they play a role on somebody, the way they feel and how actually they, a, a, adhere to the drug, whether they will come to the clinic and all that. So I think we we, we saw how we, in the early part of the epidemics in Zambia, how people, when they learned about COVID, they committed suicide. In HIV, they had one of the diseases that was highly stigmatized, how people would actually not take drugs. So even up to today, we still have people who fear to test. It's because illness is very, very complex. It's linked to social issues, yeah. So because of that, human beings create what we call illness narratives and explanatory models, and those can actually really influence them on whether they can come for treatment or not. So in illness narrative, a story that a patient tells and significant others will be family members retell to give coherence to the distinct events and cause of suffering. So these narratives are influenced by culture and society. 
And on the other hand, experimental, because they are related, experimental models are held by professions and patients, which consists of ideas about an episode of sickness and its treatment that can be employed in those uh, by all in those uh, those involved in the clinical process. So these actually are very, very important uh, uh, as health workers, if you want to actually understand, like try to get a sense of how, how somebody relates their illness and what they actually, how they link it to societal issues. You get a sense of uh, how probably you can work together with the patient uh, in a collaborative way to deal with some of the issues that, that at least within the context of a doctor, you may be able to, but also where you can't, you can refer them to people who can help them. Yeah, so that those are experimental models. And they uh, basically, Arthur Clayman is, has actually written quite a lot. Uh, so as he says, these are notions about cause of disease, diagnostic criteria and treatment options. So they will actually have information on when, what, how, cause of signal and treatment. So patients will have their story and the vision. And sometimes because of the perception they have, they may actually not really say everything. Yeah, so, uh, because they fear, maybe they will be they will be shouted at and all that kind of thing. So there are a lot of differences, mostly between the clients and practitioners in terms of experimental models. And so basically, if you see my slides, I got it from one of my former students who actually did a study looking at uh, experimental models of cervical cancer among women accessing cervical cancer care and treatment at a cancer disease hospital. So she was doing a, a, it as part of a MPH dissertation. And they, she presented this work in one of the conferences. So I just like borrowed the slide. So actually, if you look, the lay perspective, for example, a, they perceived cervical cancer as witchcraft, something that has to do with monopause and incurable disease, just as smelly water, vaginal illness. And even the understanding of the cause, some people thought it was, they are being bewitched no knowledge on cause somewhere because of uncircumcised men eating chemicals and food. So there's a bit of information, but also clearly they had alternative explanation. And on prevention, some didn't know, but some said avoiding position, good nutrition, male circumcision. So a bit of information. And they, in terms of perception of treatment, of course there are some who thought it cannot be done by doctors and they, all that. So these are the dynamics. And if you get a sense of the beliefs that actually the patient comes with and you allow that, that narrative to actually really, to come on your table encounter without actually really suppressing it, you actually really do well. And I would encourage to actually really do, and there's quite a lot of literature that has been done around that. So then improving health workers, I have to, to finish soon. Improving health patient interaction through stronger communication skills. So uh, one of uh, the people has written quite a lot, uh, Dr. Waskin, actually is a medical doctor who has a PhD in medical sociology. Uh, he argues that medical language generally excludes a critical appraise of the social context. So health workers need not need to be equipped with skills of reading in between the lines from the narratives that actually patients talk about the, what they want to actually be. So which sometimes we call discourse analysis. Like for example, a woman visits her doctor because of irregularities in her heart rhythm. She complains that palpitations and shortness of breathing, breath are actually interfering with her ability to do housework. The doctor checks a, an electrocardiogram while she exercises, changes her cardio, uh, cardio medicines and congratulates her in her efforts to maintain a tight household. So, but it looks straightforward like that. But actually, if you look, this is actually linked to issues of gender and issues of actually a women's role in a home. And it can actually even be much deeper if she actually really have shortness of breath and palpitations, she may actually worry that she may not do other marital duties and in the process may lose the husband to another person. It's, the story can be that bigger. There's a lot of reading in, in between lines. Another one, a man comes to his doctor several months after a heart attack. He's depressed. His period of, uh, uh, of disability payments will expire soon. His union is about to go on strike. He tells the doctor, his doctor tells him that he's physically able to return for work and that working will be good for his mental health. The doctor also prescribes an antidepressant and a tranquilizer. But actually, if you look in all this, uh, this depression actually is linked to deeper troubling issues of survival in society. So there's quite a whole lot of things that actually are complex. So we have I've been involved in, in, in research to try to, uh, to uh, explore some of these. And this paper, which we actually really 
worked with uh, one of my colleagues from University of Colorado, which we call support or control, qualitative interviews with Zambian women on, on male partner involvement in HIV care during and after pregnancy. Actually reviewed the complex nature of how a HIV, accessing HIV care is linked to many other issues. So it reviewed that there are multiple layers of gender inequality that women must navigate in their journey through health, HIV care during and after pregnancy. So gender inequities and social norms coupled with HIV stigma, hindered status, uh, disclosure by men women, which actually made at adherence and HIV care more challenging. And as a doctor, sometimes you may wonder why they're not, are they not adhering? Sometimes they may not even tell you, but you actually see that the patient is not progressing. So in this, we uncovered key aspects related to gender structures, which are societal issues in the lives of women with HIV often full of contradictions they endured while navigating HIV care and treatment and, and, and basically after, after that. Yeah, so I think that it was just an example and you can actually find this paper uh, it's published. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the people in this paper is, I think is in the department of obstetric and, and gynecology. Now we call it Women Hospital, Dr. Ahmed. Yeah, so he has been involved in a broader way also, which was a quantitative aspect. Then I suggested about disciplinary. I think that's more or less like where we are actually going. Most research now require understanding of a, things in a complex way. So epidemiology, biomedical sciences need to be actually really, a, 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 there's also need for understanding of behavioral sciences, social sciences. And this is something that has been advocated. If you look at these two doctors, Arthur Clayman, they actually really argued in 1981, say the key task for medicine not to diminish the role of biomedical sciences in theory and practice of medicine, but to supplement them with an equal application of social sciences in order to provide both a comprehensive understanding of disease and better care of patients. The problem is not too much science, but too narrow a view of science relevant medicine. So I think they're arguing that there is need beyond pathogenesis to actually bring in understanding of social science, beyond psychology to actually bring in this. And so there are many ways, like for example, in the past, how social sciences have been able to work. I've, I've been working with doctors for a long time trying to actually really, uh, look at things from another angle. So they can work, social sciences have worked with health problems to understand and do with health problems, like work to understand barriers, for example, condom use or medical interventions, belief, attitudes, adherence to medicine, cancer and social support. Also, social sciences have actually also subjected the medicine to studying it as a social phenomena where we analyze assumptions and aligning biomedicine. The criticism that comes in this comes from there, studying the forms of speech in biomedicine and the language, the military metaphors that are used in medicine, for example, to uncover ways in which social meanings are embedded in biomedical concepts and categories. And also demystifying medicine, show that problems of medicine are problems of society. The effects of capitalism, capitalist organized society on health and invites uh, actually, it's supposed to be uh, evaluated I mean, and also taken into consideration. And the incorporation of indigenous knowledge and decolonization, like other forms of knowledge, Teresa argued that indigenous knowledge can play a role in healthcare and health education and needs to be respected and compressed in healthcare. There's need to invest in building research theories, models, and practices based on indigenous knowledge and fair to explore indigenous knowledge from local communities brings a mix of suspicion, resistance, and realistic expectations and complex social issues for both communities. And I think we have seen some of these with this COVID-19 epidemic, how people, they would doubt whether it exists, but also the pushback on, on vaccines. Yeah. So I think that's why, and these are some of the, uh, the books that you can actually look at and some articles. There's quite a lot of rich literature in this and they, yeah, so in the interest of time, I'll not go through any of this. Yeah, thank you. Hello? Brilliant. Thank you very much for the talk. Wenza, do you want to wrap up there? Um, I'm just checking through the chat. If I thought there are any questions, or if at all there is anyone who has a question for Dr. Mwemba, you can unmute and ask before we, we close. Good afternoon, Dr. Mwemba. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the eye-opening presentation. 
Hello. I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question on mystification. You you had mentioned that um, the current medical approach to illness it doesn't take into account the, the environment where the patient is coming from. So on the way forward, how yes. do we how do we counter that so that we apply both models whereby when we treat a patient in the as we are treating our patients in our hospitals as doctors, we take into account of the environment where they are coming from. I asked that question of something like the way we treat malnutrition in clinical practice, which are what I've observed is that uh, when a child comes to the hospital with the severe malnutrition, for example, we will treat the malnutrition in the hospital. We treat those issues that are of immediate concern. When they go back into the community, you find that these children, again, they are brought back maybe twice for the over the same problem and we keep on treating the, the same problem over and over because we have not really taken into account of the social aspects and the economic aspects in, in the communities they are coming from. So basically my question is, how do we incorporate all these approaches uh, moving forward? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So thanks, thanks for, for that. Yeah, so basically, actually, and it's a perfect example, malnutrition is one which really is purely a, a social issue as much as it manifests itself as a medical issue. Yeah, so and basically, so at the end of the day, a, as doctors, there's only so much you can do. Uh, and that's why to a large extent, they actually argue that some of the things you can do as doctors is play that advocate's role. Uh, and if such things, you see such things where a, a child literally comes because they have no food and then you treat them, you may give them medicines, they go back where they will still not access food. It actually raises a bell. So of course, for us in academics, one way we actually really do is to actually publish those and try to push for policy change. And that's where government needs to come in. That's where actually the health system needs to come in. So a functioning government in most cases will actually look at children within those contexts, like for example, nutrition, who may be vulnerable, who may need to be supported. So that's why when you talk about a intersectoral approach and all that, social class transfer, for example, which of course has been uh, has been uh, abused by by politicians and some, and some government officials. If they are supposed to actually really come to mitigate on such kind of things, where sometimes they support a household to try to actually really also deal with the household as much as doctors can do the individual patients, but also you are trying to actually do at, at household level. So that's why that intersector approach which I talked about is very very important and they. Uh, like for example, at UTH, you have a medical social worker office. And I, I think basically that office is really supposed to make such linkages. But of course, if at the end of the day, this, the resources are being abused and all that, then probably what we need to do is more at political level. And that's why at the end of the day, to solve some of the health problems we are having is to solve political questions. So, so I think it, it intersect, I, it, this may not be the only answer. I'm sure some people may have other ways they can suggest, but basically it's all interlinked. It's all interlinked. Trying to identify such households, uh, the whole office of medical social worker is supposed to come in to try to do. And I think now the ministry has employed to their credit uh, in all major hospitals, what they call health promotion practitioners who can take up, and because they are trained in such kind of social, uh, psychosocial uh, dimensions of health, who can actually really be uh, supposed to take up some of those issues and try to see what opportunities and linkages for children who I need so that we don't get them back eventually again as patients. Yeah, so they are not easy issues, but they're tough. But of course, uh, the fact that they are tough we, it does not mean we can just ignore them. And, but basically, that's a great example of you know, protein of nutrition. But anybody else can suggest uh, uh, ways to actually deal with that question that has been raised. Then I wanted also to find out if you are going to share that PowerPoint presentation with us. Yes, I'll send it straight uh, away to Mwenda, and then she'll, she'll share with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
So I, I can mention that, like, for example, in our uh, health promotion undergraduate program, actually, we developed a course now, we call it History and Philosophy of Science and, and Medicine, where we deal with these issues in a more complex way with, of course, so if you look, we actually really draw quite a lot on philosophy, critical social science, uh, to actually really argue and be able to unmask the way our society works, uh, including the healthcare system. So, so basically, there is a, a course that actually we just developed, which is running, uh, just in case some people be interested. But it's it's an, it, it brings in quite a lot of these issues, and it's an eye opener to things we take for granted. All right. Thank you. So